everybody. I hope we are live. Lisa and I are so excited to be doing this live, and I see a few people are already joining us. Calvin hey, hi. is actually a couple of uh, uh, miles from me, not very far. Uh, you know Calvin. I do, yes. <laughs> Welcome. He's great. And yes. Marsha and Catherine from the UK, yes. Awesome. <laughs> New Jersey, Florida. Hi, Laurie from New Jersey, not far as well. <laughs> Actually, she's closer to you than uh, to me from New yes, Jersey. From New Jersey, yes. <laughs> so today for this special photo talk, I'm very, very excited to have uh, Lisa uh, Kuchara. She's an OM system ambassador, a great friend. And uh, she's excited to come and uh, talk uh, to us about her photography. Tell us a little bit about, a little more about who she is. And uh, I also have one of your book that I hope we can talk about <laughs> later on. I'm very, very excited. But uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. And then if anybody has any questions, just put them in the chat as well. And we'll make sure that we'll, uh, we'll address them as well. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. And Lisa, yes. tell us a little bit about you. So thank you. Thank you for doing this. So um, I have been into photography since I was a teenager and definitely very passionate about almost all aspects of photography. For me, it gives us a chance to be able to like slow down and notice really cool things in the day. Like it goes by so quick, but when you're intimate and in looking at a particular subject and interacting with it, it seems like time almost stands still and you're just in that moment. And to me, that's very replenishing. It helps to kind of rejuvenate my soul when I'm out there and in nature. Um, I actually met my husband, Tom, through photography. So we actually met in a camera club. So not only did it bring me many good photography trips, but it also brought me love. So. I love that. Join your local camera club, especially if you are single. <laughs> I, I love the story of you meeting uh, your husband, Tom. Can you share it with us? Yeah. So we were in the New Haven Camera Club and they did a lot of field trips. And on all the field trips, Tom and I kept finding ourselves in the back seat of the car together. We did not know that everybody was trying to set us up. They did not let us in on that. And so it was constantly this person in the back seat and we were just going to all those. And then it Finally, at some point, we had somebody that was working in my laboratory and they were married to somebody that worked with Tom. And they both happened to mention to each other that, hey, wait, you know, they're trying to set you up. And we we're like, oh, wait, maybe we should actually go on a date. So he sent me an email and he said, would you like to go photograph a frog or kiss a frog? <laughs> so we've always had frogs um, involved in our relationship, so to speak. We had so many photographers at our wedding. Our wedding photographer actually rewrote his contract because there were so many cameras at that that he wrote it that, that he needed to be like the exclusive photographer for going forward <laughs> oh my god <laughs> yeah, i can't it imagine <laughs> it must have been very intimidated to be your photographer at your wedding <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> We have um, somebody was doing some very informal video and they were in the back of the church. And it's like watching Bop the Gopher because you'd see one person stand up and then another person, another person watching the video just cracks me up. It's just like that game Bop the Gopher. <laughs> and it must have been also very blinding if people were using the flash. <laughs> were you feeling like a celebrity? <laughs> I don't, I was so just enamored with Tom. I didn't notice any of that. So <laughs> that's the right answer. <laughs> well, my and best is he, when he had, so Tom had his hip replaced. He played a lot of basketball and injured himself. So he had his hip replaced. We're in the hospital and the nurse says to him, do you need any oxygen? And he said, yes, my wife takes my breath away. <laughs> okay. The the nurse, like, she cracked up as she's walking out the hall. <laughs> that I can hear him say that too. So talking about Tom, um, um, I hear photo photographers who sometimes complain about, oh, if only you know I had a partner who was a photographer, he would come with me, we would go on vacation, photograph, I wouldn't have to spend like 10 minutes only to do this type of photography. Um, do you think, so there are advantages, obviously, do you think there are disadvantages as well? And what are those? Um, so for the most part, it is a huge advantage. There is nobody there looking at their watch, you know, nobody wondering why we haven't gone to dinner when we said we would eat at seven. If the light is good or the animals are good, we procrastinate and 
maybe we'll end up eating, you know, junk on the way home if the photography is great. So for the most part, it is really good. Um, we do have to buy two of everything. So therefore, I can usually find my stuff. So you'll notice all my stuff has pink gaffer tape on it because if he borrows it, I want to make sure that I get it back. So I generally know where all my stuff is. So that's one, um, you know, slight disadvantage is buying two of everything and making sure we kind of keep track of all of that. Um, I know that people who are married to a non-photographer, they also get to use their partner's um, luggage. So oftentimes like that bag that you get to put in there, they don't have to worry. We have to pack two camera gears where if you have a partner, they can then carry some of your camera gear um, with you. Um, but it's, it's amazing what we can do together because we don't have that pressure of having to get home to somebody else or having a trade off in that. And that enhances us to be so much more creative and just be out there as much as we can. Do you feel like there is a competition between the two of you? Occasionally there is. Um, it was funny. Um, he generally likes his pictures more than he likes mine. And one day he accidentally downloaded one of my cards and he's going, oh my God, look at this. Look at this. These are amazing. The best pictures I've ever gotten. And he's raving. And then he goes, wait a minute, I didn't take that picture. And then he realized that they were my pictures. It was the most he's ever raved about my pictures ever is when he thought they were his. <laughs> oh, that is hysterical. You should switch cards. Because yeah. are you photographing a lot of the same subject? Or do you feel like you each have like different subject that you like to photograph? often do different subjects. So we were down in uh, Florida for a week. And when we went on the trails, oftentimes like he'll go left and I'll go right. We will text each other. Something really cool is happening. We need to connect back. But he went and he photographed two sandhill cranes with these little baby colts. And he was getting down on the ground and he was just having a blast. And I was over photographing other species. And in that case, I think it was better because we did get now twice the number of subject matter. But some things we do tend to look for things that are odd. Um, we like things that are wonky. So one day we went and photographed flowers and there were like millions of flowers in this field. And one of the pictures we came home with was the same. It was bizarre. Like what are the odds? But we both look for things that are wonky and we both were caught by that particular subject matter. Oh, that is so cool. And I, I see uh, uh, Cindy who said, I have a great camera, Sherpa. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the disadvantages. He doesn't usually want to carry my gear because he's carrying his own gear. <laughs> exactly. So unfortunately, that that, that wouldn't work. Um, he's been great. He also helped Tom when we were doing some light painting. So not only is a Sherpa, but he was willing to stand behind the camera and kind of look at what was going on. And as we were doing light painting, we could see it live behind the camera. Um, he was there uh, giving Tom some advice on one of our workshops as well. So Tom was light painting and he could see, her husband could see behind the camera. So it was kind of cool. Oh, that's so cool. And so where are you located? You are in Connecticut. That's correct? I'm in Connecticut. So it's about halfway between Boston and New York. But we travel all over um, regularly from Canada down to Florida and then um, other places as well. And we really do enjoy traveling. Um, I kind of equate it to there's a word called Zugenru. And it's this idea that animals have this urge to migrate. Even if you put a like a wild animal bird in a cage, it tends to go like toward the north and the south when those times of the year happen. So it's this kind of instinctual urge to migrate like wildebeest or birds. And I think as a photographer, like I have that too, because I want to go like right now we were supposed to go someplace, but the blue Himalayan poppies are blooming. I'm like, okay, I got to switch everything around and we got to go there. Um, I feel like we migrate to wherever the birds or the animals or the flowers are. And that's where our travels take us is wherever what's blooming or migrating or nesting or breeding or whatever's going on. So Zuganru. <laughs> Do you, I love that. Do you feel like you are influenced by where you are? Like, I feel like I'm very influenced by New Hampshire in my photography. Do you think that being in Connecticut had an, had an impact or not at all? Like, as you say, you have to travel and you uh, by just, you have that urge to go and, and, and travel and it has more of an impact than being in Connecticut. I, I 
think it, it influences me to be more creative for everyday things because I can't just go out. If I lived in Chincoteague, I could go out every day and photograph birds and sunsets and sunrises. Here, it's much harder to find some of that subject matter. So I think, therefore, you have to work at being creative and see things a little bit more creatively. Um, I do find that we do a lot of our travel. And it's fascinating to me. If it's raining in Connecticut, like we generally go like, yeah, we'll just stay home. But if we're anyplace else and it's raining, we embrace it and we'll be out all day photographing in the rain. So I think you have that kind of inertia that sometimes happens from your own place as well. But I think that urge to travel of just whatever's blooming, whatever's migrating, whatever's, you know, doing courtship, that's where mm -hmm. I kind of want to be. Is there like one workshop that you really would like to do that you're thinking, uh, you know, this is a place or this is a subject I would love to photograph, but you haven't done it yet? <laughs> All right. So if somebody told me I have a ticket to go anywhere. I want to go to Easter Island during a noon moon and photograph the stars over the heads in Easter Island. That's my ultimate. I don't know if it'll ever happen, but that definitely, if somebody said to me, here's a ticket anywhere, that's where I'm going. <laughs> I love that. And oh, actually, Eric Rock is Eric. Eric, one of the people that introduced me to Zuganru. And I actually now, so we were talking about that urge and he put the word to my urge and my feeling. And I have actually created a camera club program that I've given at photography organizations, uh, bird clubs, garden clubs, and camera clubs about Zuganru, about this idea. And it kind of goes through the seasons and this urge we have to, to travel. And it's so bad that if my cards were full, And yet tomorrow you said you can go back to that location again, or I could like edit the pictures I have now. I'm going back out. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, there are actually a couple of uh, uh, ambassador here on the on the channel. Uh, I see uh, Lee who is coming up as well, saying hi, hi Lee. Yeah. And actually, some people have been on workshop with Lee. Marsha said she, she was in Big Bang, so I've never been to Big Bang. I think like I, that this is my next trip, maybe. So that's what I'm thinking of. Um, is there one uh, lens that is your go-to lens? Do you have one lens where you're like, this is like, I will not live with, I, I will not live without it. That's mine. <laughs> so I guess it depends on what I'm photographing. So I guess mm -hmm. I would say I have three, all right, I'll go with four lenses, depending on what I'm photographing. The 150 to 400 is on my camera all the time. It is like Loctite super glued to my camera. Like it does not come off of one of my bodies. And then my other camera usually has on like the 90 millimeter to be able to get all those cool details. But I love the 12 millimeter for night photography. So like if you had to pick one, like you have to tell me like what I'm photographing. So I guess those would be the three I use the most would be the 12 millimeter prime. The uh, 150 to 400 is like, oh my gosh, it changed my photography immensely. Um, it was hard for me with the older camera. It was so heavy to get the flight shots. Yes. And now with that lens, I can hold it all day long and I just get amazing flight lens, you know, flight photography. But I love the details too. So oftentimes I will go out with two cameras. I have a black rapid strap and I'll have like the 60 millimeter or the 90 millimeter on one for details. And then I have that 40 to 150 because if the birds are slow, I can always find a spider or a grasshopper or you know something on the boardwalk that is cool. That's true. I feel like I want to show a couple of your images, actually. I'm going to put uh, your website on, uh, on the stream because I... I've known you when I started photography. I was so inspired because I'm a big fan of frogs. I absolutely adore all your frog photography. I mean, just look at those. I just don't know which one to pick because they're all so <laughs> cute, you know. Uh, and so I my nickname also, is the Frog Whisperer. Yes. <laughs> Like the book. So you published this book, which is absolutely fantastic. And I've never realized like how many different uh, type of frogs there are. And actually, I should say you owned, I can't believe one person owns so many frogs. Can you tell us a little bit about your passion for frogs and how you photograph them? So I at one point was going to go on a frog photography workshop and Tom said to me, why are you going to spend all this money? You already know how to photograph. You photograph frogs really well. I said, but I want all these cool species. And it was going to be like $5,000 for me to go on this trip. So he said, well, why don't you just buy some frogs? So words he eventually uh, you know, <laughs> did not like that he said. 
I had over 350 frogs at one point. It was crazy. And then he said, no more frogs. You cannot come up with any more frogs. So I brought praying mantises and chameleons and geckos and all kinds of other things. Um, I now am down to a more reasonable amount because we travel so much. It was hard to find a good pet sitter or pet sitter retired. So I only have about 10 frogs now, two chameleons and a praying mantis. So it is a much more reasonable number for, for everybody. But they are so cool. When the dogs come in and they start barking, like the, the frogs like communicate back and they start singing to the dogs. It's, it's really neat. <laughs> And do they change with the season as well? Because uh, does that have an influence? So, for example, we're yeah, going to start. So much. They sing all year Stay round. Out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is funny. Do you have like a, uh, I know in, in your book, you have a couple of, of fun story as well of some frog escaping and <laughs> yes. being saved by your uh, frog sitter instead of yes. being released by nature, into <laughs> nature. So um, do you have like a, a, a a story that you want to share about your frog? Well, definitely the dogs. And at the time I had two cats as well. They knew the frogs were pets. So if one did get out, like they would come and get me and let me know um, versus if they're out for a walk, they were kind of like, all right, this is fair game. We're going to chase it away or whatever. So there were times where you'd go down to the laundry room and the dog would just stop and like, you know, be pointing and you'd realize one of the frogs got out. So there were times um, I went to California and I had two big, huge Madagascar frogs and I came back and they were out and there was nothing in the, in the cage. I said, Tom, what happened to them? He says, I don't know. So I'm, you know, watering and cleaning up everything. And all of a sudden I go to pick up a water bottle and one of the frogs is sitting right on top of the water bottle. <laughs> so they kind Oh God. Back and I eventually put them back in there. But they had learned how to unlatch the um, the clasp to get out of the thing. Because when I put them back in, the next day they were gone again. And so I was like, okay, wait a minute. What's happening to the frogs? And they, I had to duct tape the uh, <laughs> their terrarium. And I, I love how they seem to be very easy models posing. Is that true? It's just... So the first frog that I bought i bought and i shared it with three other people so he would spend a month at my house and then he would go traveling in a month at each of the houses so his name was pixel he was a red-eyed green tree frog and the other three people said how do you get him to sit still like they just jump out i can't get any good photographs and i said well i talked to them so i would just all the time talk to them and i think that's how i got the nickname frog whisperer so then they started well all right we'll be photographed you need to be here so the four of us would kind of photograph together at whoever's house so that i could continue to talk to them and be kind of this frog whisperer person because i don't know when you talk to them i guess they kind of know you're not a predator because predators tend to be in stealth mode and so i just talk to them all the time <laughs> You know, I remember you told me that you have to talk to the frogs and now that's what I do and it works very well. I do that with insects as well. Yeah. But think about it. Predators are stealth mode. And remember, you're also coming there with a big lens. So you look like a one-eyed predator. Remember, predators have their eyes going forward. So not only do we as humans, but we're behind our camera lens. So we really do look like predators. Predators are quiet. So That's if you true. kind of talk, I mean, I'm not singing or laughing or yelling at them. I'm talking to them. And they kind of then know, like, okay, she wouldn't be talking to me if I was gonna, if she was going to eat me. <laughs> That's true. Now I'm explaining the process. I'm going to take a couple of photos. I would appreciate if you could cooperate with me. And usually it works pretty well. <laughs> yep. I, I even lately, um, we were outside in, in Florida. I actually say to the, the specimen, whether it's an insect, I say, if you're really cooperative, you might end up on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> this is really funny. If you give me your Instagram account, little frog, I will send it to you. Um, do you I, do you feel like, I don't know, because I read your book and I always feel like when I think of you, I think of, of all your friends frog photo which I love but you also do a lot of live composite uh, um, that is, is spectacular as well I might have some that I can share also with everybody so live um, composite is just an amazing technology and it definitely is something I'm very addicted to the fact that I can see the back of the camera during the exposures is just wonderful so I really do love mo 
most aspects of photography. Um, most people nowadays are mirrorless. Um, when we were in Florida this past week, we did hear a few people still with, you know, DSLRs and buffers filling up, but most people are mirrorless. So the technologies of having the live histogram and having these features at your disposal is wonderful. But then certain cameras have certain features that kind of go above and beyond that as well, such as live composite. So there you get to actually see the back of your camera. So I think of it like a glass oven, and you're cooking brownies. And maybe I like my brownies really crunchy and like Lee likes them really chewy. So you get to like look in the oven as they're cooking and you get to kind of hit done when it's done. So it makes it so much more fun and so much more productive. So it definitely is a fun feature. I think it's a great time to be a photographer because before you would have a vision in your head and how did you achieve that? And now we have these amazing technologies that allow you to be able to really get out there and be an artist and kind of show what's in your, in your head. Do you do some uh, uh, workshop with live painting uh, and night photography? Yeah, so we do workshops of almost every genre. We do bird photography, nature photography, landscape, macro, creative photography, uh, still life photography, light painting inside and light painting outside. So definitely have a, a blast. Um, we will be um, announcing um, one in coming up on Wild Side Nature Tours coming to Maine also. So we're going to be going to the puffins and doing some things um, outside with regard to seascapes and nightscapes. Um, and and then we we'll also have one in New Hampshire. So that one is the one I'm doing with you. And that's going to be a blast. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that because I think you picked an inn that is just a quintessential New England, New Hampshire type of an inn as well. So. Yes, I'm so excited. First of all, I have to say that you got tickets for the puffin is amazing. <laughs> so I'm sure that as soon as we're going to put this one on Wild Side Nature Tour, it's going to go very, very fast because those tickets are sold in um, in the matter of really a minute. So it's really amazing that you were able to get some and you'll be able to out in nine tour. minutes <laughs> it was crazy <laughs> yes i mean it is always um yeah like uh, waiting to go on to a taylor swift concert and everybody's clicking to get those tickets that's how the puffin tours are uh, but yes i'm so excited about the uh, new hampshire one that we've planned together We've been talking about doing a workshop uh, together for a while. Uh, I know Tom is not coming, but maybe you'll sneak him into the the room and uh, maybe he'll, he'll, maybe he'll want to join us. You never know. But um, the inn that I picked is a gorgeous historical inn with views, absolutely stunning views of the White Mountains. And we one thing that really attracted me to this inn is that we are not going to have to go anywhere for this workshop, just stepping out of the rooms and they have a extremely luxurious garden that we'll be able to photograph. So this is why I picked this place. And then there are a couple of places around the inn that will be like a five to 15 minute drive for us to, uh, to access with other views of the White Mountains, Blueberry Path. Uh, there is also Tin Mountain, which is a, a, a center uh, for that they're preserving the forest. And so there's a lot of trails. Uh, we did the workshop with uh, Steve Morello actually a couple of months ago over there. Uh, I think a few people uh, from the, uh, the sh that are in the chat right now uh, joined us as well. It was just... I don't know. I just, I love, I love New Hampshire. And I feel like if you want to do New Hampshire the right way, you have to stay in one of those historical inn, you know, actually I might be able to, um, to show it here. Uh, it's called Snow Village Inn. Uh, and uh, here, they say a true romantic. Romantic for us means that there's going to be uh, stunning uh, bugs, stunning flowers. And uh, see, don't you want to just, after uh, a good uh, day of photography, this is where I want to be. <laughs> so um, they have a, a 
you can see some of the gardens here and some of the in here. I feel like it's a little bit like Gilmore Girls. That's that's what it's going to feel like. We're going to have a Gilmore Girl adventure in New Hampshire and just have fun because that's what it's all about is eating good food, feeling like nourished inside, but also outside by taking, you know, uh, photos of all our surrounding and look at those views. So I think we're going to do a lot of fun, having a lot of fun with the macro photography, also with birds birds with wildlife you never know you know moose coyotes bobcats they're around yeah bears lots of bears uh so i'm hoping that we'll also be able to uh, to have some great adventures with wildlife you can never tell right but uh and lee's very kind he says that he's putting the link to our workshop which is great thank you so much lee um so it is we talked a lot about what type of workshop we wanted to offer. And for us, it's really important to offer um, workshops with a minimum of four people per instructors. So we only have eight space open for this workshop. It's going to be very, very special. So if you are interested, you should sign up because we don't know when those four uh, seats are going to be taken. Uh, and there's the option as well if you want to go with someone uh, to share a room as well. Um, so, yes, I can't wait. And I can't wait to spend some time with you photographing. There better be some tree frog in some of those flowers. It would be great. <laughs> they love they love the lilies and the dahlias, so you never know. So it could be very fun. And I think your your point is well taken up. This is intimate. A lot of times when you go to New England, you are doing a lot of traveling between place to place. I know when we've led workshops there, we're spending a lot of time in the car. And that can be tiresome for people. This is going to be very, like you said, centric about the inn that we have that has been chosen. And it's really going to allow us to then explore the creative processes and kind of, like you said, nurture yourself while you're there as well. So different from some of the ones that are much more about the all of New England rather than this one here, which will get, like you said, some wildlife, some landscape, some flowers, but it's also going to allow us to really get whatever vision is in your head and get you to be able to express that through your camera. Yes. And also part of the workshop, we are going to have a pre workshop zoom to prepare you for uh, the workshop and also we are going to do a post workshop zoom uh, to go over some of your images as well because i know it's only going to be two days and actually three days when you arrive on friday but we want to make sure that we give you the most out of you know this weekend and we're going to continue to help you out with your photography and we want to see you know uh give you some time to post process your image the way you want to also post process them after uh, getting some feedback from us and from the people attending the workshop so um and here i'm just showing a couple of uh, some of our images that uh, were taken uh, here in uh, in new england so yes um if if you want sign up it would be fantastic to have you I, I love workshops because you it's great to have live because you get to talk to everybody but there's nothing like being face to face <laughs> I want that. I want to have uh, that uh, with, with people, meeting uh, some of the people. I know Diane was actually uh, at Tin Mountain, so she knows the area. She's local as well. She's from Mass, but uh, she came for um, one of the workshops with Steve. So uh, someone is actually asking, Tom, uh, I want to show this on the uh, screen. Have you, I, I uh, have either of you ever considered the Great Smoky Mountains for photography trips? Have you, Lisa? Yes, I, I have. We just, there's only so many hours and days in the year. I think it would be a great place. I don't know, Tom, if you're from that particular area, if you just have a desire to go there. But definitely, you know, so much variety with regard to the wonderful hills and the trees and the bears and the animals and, you know, the water that's there definitely would be a great place. So I don't know, maybe this one will be uh, the inspiration for the next one. And maybe Emily and I will go to... Uh, uh, keep following Wild Side and keep following us for future endeavors. So definitely, we, we have fun in our photography. So I think it's not just creating snapshots. And so therefore, I think this could be definitely something as you're looking through other trips that are being offered, you'll see that there's kind of this intimate nature of these trips that allow you to be able to 
better your photography, not just get to that particular place as well. Salamander capital. Oh my gosh. Oh, I love salamanders. That would be so cool to start overturning little logs and seeing if we could find some salamanders. So I guess he's offering to kind of, you know, give us some inside information on this, Emily. So maybe we need to uh, to talk to, uh, to Tom a little bit. <laughs> yes. Tom, please contact both of us and uh, we'll see what we can do because that would be fantastic. I actually, I don't know the Smoky too, too much. I spent only a few days there. I have some families um, uh, who uh, uh, used to live over there, but I had such a fantastic time. The light, the people, the, it's just such a great place. I love to do a workshop over there. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, just please contact us. And we also do private tours, right? That's also an option. You do that as well. You just came back from a private tour in uh, Florida, right? Yes. So um, that is definitely something that Tom and I offer. We do one-on-one -on -one Zooms for mentoring. We do one-on-one -on -one Zooms for particular topics, but we also do one-on-ones. A lot of people want to just have an exclusive with us to be able to not have to worry that someone else might be at a different level. So while I was down in Florida, we presented at a, at a camera club and then we did a one-on-one -on -one for somebody we've been doing Zooms with for a while, but there's nothing like actually being there and, you know, feeling the buttons with them and being able to set things up rather than doing it via, via Zoom as well. Um, we just love being out there and inspiring people to be able to take better pictures. As I mentioned, it's a great time to be a photographer and there's just a plethora of different subject matters at your disposal. And I think kind of, Emily, back to your question of like living in Connecticut, perhaps that has made it where, I mean, if you do go to the state park and or the national park and it's closed because of a flood, like we're going to have just as much fun and find just as much subject matter. And perhaps that versatility came from living in kind of a photographic desert type of a place. <laughs> and that's what I love about you is that you always find something to photograph. I could be just walking around and you're like, oh, look, that looks like a face. I could <laughs> take a photo. And it's so inspiring and refreshing um, because there's an opportunity at every corner. You just have to have the right eye and find it. I'm trying to find one on your website to show people because... I love, yeah, I love some of the, uh, maybe, you know, I think we posted some uh, for, because we also are doing a macro retreat for yes. uh, ambassadors, uh, but uh, I'm just trying to find uh, some of the photos, uh, but I don't know if I have one in, in mind with the rock and the face that looks like I love it should be in there, the pink hat lady. Yes. I know. I'm going to show it right now on the stream. Uh, so that's another thing that we are doing. Uh, it is uh, going to happen in September. And it's a retreat from September 6 to 9 with six OM system ambassadors. So Eric, who was also uh, in uh, the chat. Uh, so we decided why not just, you know, uh, go and have fun in Maine at Steve's house that he uh, nicely offered. And this one is only macro. So the one that is in New Hampshire, we're going to have fun with every type of photography. But this one is really all about macro. And actually, we don't have that many seats left for this one. It's been it's been filling up every day. <laughs> and okay. we well, have... It might be eight seats left so some six eight there's not that many left so yep yes so if you want to get on this one uh do it before you know the end of the week because i think we might be already at capacity very very soon uh and same i'll put the link uh, and i know diane is coming so we're looking forward to seeing you again um and um it's going to be a, a fantastic opportunity as well very very different style of, of workshop so but that's an, uh, another uh, option if you are looking into um, you know you invested I feel like I always said that you invested in so much money with your gear you also need to invest money in yourself as well and looking at different type of techniques and being in the field and practicing because there is nothing like it like I have a YouTube channel where I you know try to 
uh, share with you some of the things that I learn and some my path. But I think that there is nothing like being one on one and and really being in the field and try it out. Because if you don't try, then it's never going to stick. You need to practice, practice, practice. So also investing in um, in yourself in a workshop. I think it's it's key. How long, Lisa? You, I don't think you. You said how long, what was the first camera you picked up? How long have you been doing photography for? So I had a very close family friend that was into photography. So when I was about 13, I got my first camera and it was a Canon camera. And I was Canon for decades. And around 2015, 16, I started looking into some mirrorless cameras. Tom tried Fuji for a while and I tried Sony for a while and it didn't really click. And then we were actually leading a workshop, a night photography workshop at a lighthouse. And we were photographing the stars over the lighthouse. We were having a blast. And all of a sudden, the fog rolled in. And there was no more lighthouse. There was no more stars. There was nothing. But we had a whole bag of light painting tools. And so we were having fun. And I look over, and one of the participants had the, the, the EM-1. And I'm looking at his camera. And all of us have a black box because we're open for five minutes or whatever. And we can't see our picture because we're on bulb mode. And he's watching the picture. And I'm like, okay, how, how, what is this? What magic is this? And I immediately went home and I called up Hunt's photo and I said, I want one. I need one. I'm going to use it just for, you know, light painting and night photography. And he said, wait two weeks. The EM1 Mark II is going to be out in two weeks. So I ordered it. And my illusion or disillusion was that I was going to use it just for light painting and night photography. And I had very happy with all of my Canon and that didn't last very long by January of 2017. Um, we had, so the camera came out in fall of 2016. By January of 2017, we had sold all of our Canon stuff and were completely Olympus at that point and just loving all the different aspects about Olympus. Um, you mentioned the retreat. So that one is primarily for OM users, although we do have a few people with other systems coming. Mm -hmm. But our retreat in New Hampshire and then the one that Tom and I will do in Maine is open to anybody as well. Um, I saw that Pentex has a new film camera coming out and I actually yes. had one of our workshop participants say that he's ordering it. So like anybody can come on these events. So we love all aspects of photography. Yes. Um, somebody come with a cell phone and they have an app and they were doing live composite with their cell phone. So we will welcome everybody you know it's the the enthusiasm and the desire to just enjoy is the only requirement yes and then you can try as well because uh i know uh for actually most of their workshop we have loaners so uh we'll have a loaner in new hampshire and also we have loaners in maine so you'll also get to test the camera i know that's a big investment for people who are thinking of switching or adding a second system and uh, i always feel like bad saying yeah switch straight away it's like no no why don't you go and try it at your camera store? Because you can trust my words, sure, but uh, there is nothing like, I don't know if this camera is going to be the right fit for you. So you should really go and try it. And uh, being in a workshop, um, having uh, uh, an extra body that we can loan to people, I think it's also so important. Then you can decide, I should with it. And yes, it's, it's going to work for me. Or, well, you know, maybe not, or maybe as a second body then you can make a more informed decision. Yeah. Yeah, we um, have somebody that came with us on a workshop recently and they have the Fuji, the 100 megapixel, like medium format mm -hmm, Fuji, yes. and they love their camera, but they weren't able to do the night photography. They weren't able to focus because they didn't have starry night. And so they picked up an OM-1 as a second body, um, the same way different tools do different things. Then in their case, that tool was what they needed for that aspect as well. So. Yes. And actually, um, uh, Deb, hi, Deb, uh, is asking, are you both shooting with the OM-1 M2, the so Mark II? I, yeah. So we, Tom and I placed our order the day that we could, you know, place the order. Um, definitely, there were some features about it that really compelled me to be able to upgrade. Um, one was the graduated neutral density, which just is just an amazing little technology. Um, I, I teach Photoshop, I like to edit, but I have no time to edit. But anything I can do in camera to get the picture to be what I'm envisioning is that much better. So mm -hmm. that was a feature that to me was important. And then one of the things that was fun is I actually had um, the same lens on my OM-1 and the OM-1 Mark II. And I'm photographing the birds and i am got all these branches around. And at one point I kind of lost track of which camera I had in my hand. And when I tried to focus on the branch where like the, the birds were, it was completely evident to me that 
I had the OM1 Mark II because its algorithm for finding birds among the branches is just phenomenal. It is just leap year to head. So, you know, if you have an older camera, there's definitely an impetus to update. If you have the OM1, I think it depends upon the type of subject matter that you're, you're photographing. Um, if you're doing that kind of bird photography, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty neat to be able to, I had a least bitter and, you know, I could just see the eyeball among the reeds and it was just so cool because I know the OM1 never would have been able to find it. <laughs> I know I've been pretty impressed with that because uh, I same experience as you. I was out uh, walking in uh, on a in a pond, and there was a blue jet that was like hidden. I could barely see the head, and the camera it's picked it up. Was, how the technology that we have right now in our cameras is extraordinary. Yes, it is. The buffer is also enhanced on the Mark II, and I'm a heavy finger shooter. I definitely hold it down. And there were times where I'd be photographing on Pro Capture, and then I'd try to go like off, and like the buffer was still going and going. And the Mark II has a much, you know, bigger buffer. But again, if you're a landscape photographer, you don't shoot 120 frames an hour. You don't need 120 frames a second. That's so true. it depends upon the type of photography that you're you're doing. That's true. But you're right. I love the. I, I'm not. I'm starting to be more of a landscape photographer now that I move uh, to the White Mountains because there are so many gorgeous places to go and photograph. So I'm trying to be better. I'm trying to be inspired by all of you amazing landscape photographers out there. Uh, but uh, the uh, graduate, graduate natural city filter is it is really fun to try. I loved it. Uh, I know some people say oh, it's very gimmicky. Not at all. It really works as a filter and it works very, very well. I was very impressed. So I'm actually going to France in a week and uh, I can't wait to do more with uh, with this as well over there. So that's my plan. Uh, but it's for a lot of people I've been asking about Mark 1, Mark 2, what should I do? It's such a hard question because... OM1, I love this camera. I'm still, I'm going to take it with me when I go to France because I know I can rely on it. It's a great camera. And so it's hard sometimes to justify moving to the Mark II because you already got such a great camera with the OM1. So. And if you don't do birds, the EM1 Mark III is still a great camera. I mean, it's got the oh, story, yes. right? it has a lot of the other features in it. So that I have, I tell people, like, email me, let me, let me, you know, before you make your decision, um, yeah. you know, just because this is the newest or the latest doesn't mean that it's the best for you right now. There's options. It really depends on the subject matter that you're yeah. photographing. So. And actually, even if you are on a smaller budget, you know, <laughs> I love this. The TG7 is such a fantastic camera with macroscopic function. You don't need uh, an expensive camera and lens to do some macro photography. This one is just very, very fun. So uh, that's something that, you know, I would say just go and look at the TG7 or a TG6, even cheaper if you can get it uh, secondhand. Um, so that's another option. I know some people, thank you. Peter said, uh, hello from the UK. Uh, oh yes, it's true because it's not six, it's not five hour difference, right? It's five hours, not six hours. That's, uh, we oh, are already in summertime. <laughs> I know, I talked to my mom and she's like, yep, it's only five hours now. So it's true. Sorry. I hope, Peter, it will be uploaded uh, uh, when we are, you know, uh, not live anymore. So you'll be able to rewatch it. So thank you for joining us. Yeah. Uh, I know it's been quite nice in Europe. You're having fantastic weather. So uh, I, can't, I can't wait to hop on the plane and, and go to the other side and, and get some nice weather. <laughs> Um, excellent. I think um, I wanted to kind of end um, this show uh, by asking you one last question. If you could give an advice to a beginner photographer, what would it be? I would say to get out and photograph as much as you can. So there's an old quote that says your first 10,000 pictures are your worst. 
remember that was a film quote so that meant like 36 you know days at a time type you know what you know 36 frames at a time 10,000 pictures I am sure that I photograph more than that being down in Florida because 120 frames a second so like some people I know they come on a workshop and they say well the last time I picked up my camera was when I came on your workshop last year I'm thinking like if I go two or three days without picking up my camera like that's a lot just you know get out and photograph anything that you can just like you know, practice, learn, you know, learn where your buttons are, learn kind of, you know, the aspects of photography as far as like people talk tech gear, but like, what's your sweet spot? Do you like, like more 1.2 or do you like F22 or do you like focus stacking? Like, just, you know, be careful when somebody says to you, like, this is the answer. Well, that might be very well the answer for them, but that's like saying to them, well, how do you like your food? Well, if somebody likes an awful lot of one particular spice in it, it doesn't mean that I'm going to like the food that way. So kind of get out there and practice and kind of learn what's your sweet spot out there. Um, Cindy Roper's on here. She's out all the time photographing. I want to just come with her because she's out there all the time. And sometimes I'm like, I haven't got out in two days. I'm like, oh, so she inspires me because she gets out there all the time. So just get out and photograph as much as you can. I know I saw some fantastic photo from her and I'm like, why wasn't that out that time? What was I doing? I should have been out. I should have been over there as well. So it's true. We all inspired by all the photographers who are out there. And I see Mario and Julia, like, if you want fantastic weather, uh, come to Australia. Yeah, we should do a, a workshop in Australia. Oh, I would love that. New Zealand and Australia are on my list. That would be fantastic for the macro photography. But with my luck, I'll probably be eaten alive by a shark or a crocodile, but might be worth it. So speaking of eating alive, we were photographing spoonbills down in Florida. And Tom is watching this fish like jump out of the water as the spoonbill is flying across very low. And when he got the picture back, it's an alligator gar. It looks like something at a Jurassic Park. And the gar came out of the water with this huge, huge snout and big teeth. And it was trying to eat the spoonbill. I was like, oh, my. <laughs> That's, that's why we're out there to photograph those moments, those cruel moments that nature offers us. <laughs> And uh, I see uh, uh, Ginny say, I appreciate your response, Lisa, to photograph, to photograph as much as you can. Yeah, that's true. That's key. You know, not going to learn, not going to improve if your camera is on the shelf. This yeah. camera is on the shelf for the night, but tomorrow morning it's in my hands. That's how it works. Uh, <laughs> Lee, Lee said... I would love to see that. I don't know if he was referring to me being eaten by a shark and an alligator or of your experience with the spoonbill. I'll have to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> it, but like you said, it can be cruel sometimes. I was watching um, all these dragonflies out at sunset. And the next day we came back and they all had found pairs and almost all of them were mating. And they're flying around in the air. And then they started laying their eggs. And I could almost hear like the Disney music. And they're, 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 they're you know, flying along. They're laying their egg and they go a little bit and they lay their egg. And like, all of a sudden a fish jumped out and ate them. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. Oh. <laughs> Just, just went from Disney to Friday the 13th really quick in my head with the music playing. <laughs> I know already Disney, I think it's quite cruel. Marsha is like, yeah, you know, in South Florida, you have to anticipate uh, the presence of Gator everywhere. Yeah, I would be, I don't know. I don't know if it, I love Florida, but I think I would probably get in trouble over there. Yeah. I know. Marsha, we uh, just posted, um, Tom had a cell phone video of two alligators and you hear the grumble and you hear him putting his body out of the water and rumbling. Um, if you go it's on our Instagram and our Facebook, it was crazy. I, I could hear all the way down the boardwalk and Tom was right there when it happened. So yeah, you have to be careful. <laughs> No. And it's a good reminder to we taking photos, but also with our cameras and even with cell phone, we have the possibility yeah. to make videos that really adds. When I'm in the field, I always think photos, but I also think videos and that sound as well. Having a recorder, uh, it's just enhancing your experience as well. I, uh, now I always try to carry a recorder with me so I can record some of the sounds because it's just fantastic. It's fantastic. And you can use those sounds afterwards to you know, put a slideshow of your, all your images and having the uh, sound of the crocodile is just 
<laughs> it's stunning. So, oh yeah, say, oh yeah, Saint Augustine. Oh, Marsha, yes, I'm looking forward to uh, to Saint Augustine and and the crocodile. You guys will have to look after me, I think, <laughs> and guide me through Saint Augustine. <laughs> Well, I, I'm very, very thankful, Lisa, that, you know, you uh, agreed to uh, come in to talk about your photography. I've always been so, so inspired by all your work. So thank you so much again. And, and your book, if anybody wants to. So that's available on uh, Amazon. And you have a couple of publishers who also have them. Ask your library to order them as well. That's just fantastic. I think so all schools should have those. Is, it goes through kind of like stories and lenses. It's you know, it's more than just well, maybe I will never photograph a frog. Yeah. It, it definitely talks about like just the general concept of close-up and macro photography in there as well. So. <laughs> Yes, no, I, I love this book. Every time I need to have a smile on my face, I just <laughs> I just open your book and just look at those really cute frogs. That makes me so happy. That's what photography is all about, right? It's sharing with others and bringing a, a smile, an awareness, bringing a story to others. So uh, uh, thank you for making this book. And I've heard that maybe you're making another book as well. Uh, well yes, yeah. so I am trying to get finished a book on butterflies and caterpillars. So I've just been so enamored with the close-ups and the macro that we can get. And I'm just having so much fun. And I put it together and I'm like 80% there. But now the weather's getting better. We've been doing more things. I got to just settle down and get it finished because I think it's even a little bit broader than the, the frog book in that it's definitely about, you know, the behaviors and the camouflage and also, you know, some about the, the gear a little bit more as well. So hopefully that one will be available soon too. <laughs> you just need to come in to the New Hampshire in a week before the workshop and immerse yourself there and then it's all going to come to life. Your book will be done. That's what I'm thinking. And I see, oh, I see uh, Faith, so nice to see you here. Uh, you should come and, yeah, because you are in Florida. Uh, come and hang out in St. Augustine. That would be so fun. So I hope I'm always waiting for people to answer. They're not going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird sometimes with life so uh as i said that's why you're doing workshops so you have a face-to-face -face conversation uh but thank you everybody um for you know uh, uh coming for showing uh tonight if you have more questions then feel free to post any comments uh, at the end or if you're re-watching uh, this uh, talk, then post your comments below. We'll be very, very happy. Uh, Lisa and I will, will be monitoring uh, the comments. So send us anything. And I think a couple of, of you guys will send us a, a private email so we can put on more workshop with you guys in all the amazing places that you're recommending. So thank you so much again, everybody. Thank you so much, Lisa, for accepting uh, to come in as a guest. Really appreciate it. Uh, so nice to meet you uh, again, as usual. And uh, we'll see you all, hopefully, very soon. Have a great evening. Bye.